this is the outline of the talk. I uh, will first provide an overview of the Quark bootloader. Uh, then I will focus on the firmware management functionality. And um, uh, then I will discuss a security extension that is coming in the next release. And finally, if we have some time, I will discuss some internals and specifically how we manage um, persistent data in the bootloader, uh, metadata in the bootloader, and finally, some concluding remarks. So the Quark bootloader is uh, the reference bootloader for the Intel Quark microcontroller family, uh, which is basically the Intel Quark D2000 microcontroller and the Intel Quark SE microcontroller C1000. Um, the bootloader is developed as part of the software stack that we have for uh, this family of microcontrollers. And uh, the software stack and the bootloader is available on GitHub and released under a 3BSD license. So what are the main features of the bootloader? Ob obviously, we have some bootstrap features, uh, initializing the system, and uh, we also support some uh, functionality that allows to restore the context from deep sleep, because this is not done in hardware. And uh, we also have some first time initialization um, process, like the trim code computation. Um, in the next uh, release, uh, we are also adding some security hardening features, but uh, the, the, the main uh, topic of this talk is actually the firmware management functionality, which I will discuss briefly. Uh, just let me first provide an overview of the Quark MCUs so that you can have a, an idea of what kind of hardware we are talking about. So both core, both the, uh, sorry, both the SOC, the D2000 and the C1000 feature a, an x86 core code name Lakemont that runs at 32 megahertz. The C1000 is uh, more powerful than the D2000. It also has uh, another core, an ARC core, which is part of the sensor, sensor subsystem of the SOC. And it has uh, more RAM and more flash. And it also features a USB uh, controller. Um, from the flash layout point of view, however, and uh, from the, sorry, from the bootloader point of view, they are quite similar because we have to put uh, our bootloader in the OTP region, uh, which is 8K for both uh, SOC. And um, yes, so the bootloader has firmware management functionality and specifically it supports firmware upgrades, obviously but also some FM functionality like key management uh, that is coming in the next release, actually, and some system information retrieval and application arrays. So you can query the device in order to know the application that are installed, the partitioning, and so on. And these firmware management functionality are available over two uh, transports, both UART and USB. Obviously, USB only for C1000. <coughs> Um, the biggest constraint that we had while developing the bootloader was, as I said already, uh, the 8K limitation, uh, because we had to fit it in the OTP, uh, the one-time programmable flash. Um, despite that, we decided to adopt a modular approach, uh, and that was done uh, mainly with the goal of achieving extensibility and the possibility of adding new transports in the future. Um, and potentially also OTA in the future. So uh, let's see how uh, the, the modular design on the firmware manager and uh, is protocol stack. All the firmware man man management functionality is DFU based. Uh, this means that we use DFU for sending images and commands and requests to the device. And obviously DFU is a, a USB specification, uh, is a USB protocol. So we, what we did, we adapted it for UART. And we introduced what we call the Quark uh, DFU adaptation, the QDA protocol. Uh, we will see it shortly. Um, and on top of this DFU-based communication layer, we have defined a, an image format, the Quark firmware upgrade image format. and uh, the QFM protocol, the Quark Firmware Management Protocol, that basically allows to uh, have other 
some functionality different from upgrades running on top of DFU. And these are, again, the one that I said before. And specifically, the most important one is probably key provisioning done over DFU. So DFU, as you probably know, is, um, stands for Device Firmware Upgrade. It's a USB uh, standard. And uh, one interesting feature is that it does not define any uh, specific image format. Uh, what it does provide is uh, basically a way to transfer data to the device with uh, what is called DFU download and to extract data from the device with uh, DFU uploads. And both of these transfers uh, are block based. We decided to use DFU because uh, it is a well, an open and well documented standard and uh, which is also used by many other projects. And it is uh, really designed for uh, resource constrained devices. Uh, specifically, as I said, it, it has a block wise uh, transfer that basically um, allows us to uh, write a block of the image at a time because given our uh, limited resources and especially our limited RAM, we cannot store our uh, image uh, in the RAM or in a special portion of the flash. We must write it one block at a time. And then uh, another feature of DFU is that all the transmission is controlled by the device, basically. So the device is giving the timing of the communication, so you never have the risk of uh, the host uh, flooding uh, the device uh, by sending too many messages or stuff like that. Another advantage is that we, uh, there is already uh, some host tools available for it, and the most, probably the most fam famous one is DFU Util uh, that supports both Windows and Linux, and is open source as well. And uh, finally, we lack the fact that DFU does not provide uh, a, a specific image format, but, but leaves the vendor uh, the choice to define its own. Uh, that is because we wanted to add our own metadata and our own authentication mechanism in our image format. So, um, as I said, DFU is a, a, a USB standard, but we wanted to support UART as well. So what we did is we add this Quark DFU adaptation protocol, which is just an adaptation layer that makes uh, basically DFU and the kind of the uh, state machine of DFU and the communication uh, protocol of DFU available over UART as well. And uh, um, actually, the QDA protocol makes uh, DFU available over any uh, message-oriented transport. And it, since UART is actually stream-oriented, we uh, added um, another layer, uh, the XMODEM protocol, which is an old file transfer protocol that we use to transport QDA packets. Uh, we basically use it to turn the channel into a message-oriented one. And uh, we choose it beca because of its simplicity, simplicity that allows us to have a, a reduced footprint. So the QDA protocol basically provides all the DFU request response messages. So DFU download, upload, and all the other contract comments. And it also mimics some of the uh, uh, generic USB functionality, uh, among which the alternate settings feature that we use, uh, as we will see. Uh, I'd like to stress that, as I said already, QDA is not limited to X modem and UART, but is, uh, it can be applied over any message-oriented protocol. Indeed, during the early development phase, I, I basically use it over UDP uh, so that I could test the code directly on my laptop. Um, so, it, since we are porting uh, DFU to a different transport, we also needed a different host tools. Uh, for the user. And what we did, instead of reinventing the wheel, we took the util and we modified it, we forked it, and we re re basically removed the USB layer, which is libusb, and replaced it with a QDA UART layer. And uh, the, uh, the modified dfutil, we call it QM dfutil, and is available on GitHub as well under GPL2 license. Um, so thanks to USB DFU and the QDA uh, DFU, we basically have a common DFU-based communication layer on top of which we transfer. We transfer both upgrade images, which is the main uh, intent of DFU, but also we transfer what we call the other firmware management requests using the QFM protocols that I mentioned already. 
So the image format is very simple. It's actually a block-wise format, which is indeed meant to be transferred using DFU that divides the images in blocks. And in the end, this format is, is just an header that we add to the binary. Um, so we prepend this header to the binary, and, the, uh, and the, this header is, uh, it will be transferred in the first block, in the first DFU block. So it, it is processed before the image. Um, yes, this is the information that we have in the header. And the header is actually divided into two sub header, a base one that contains common information for processing the image, like the vendor ID, the product ID of the target device, um, or the application version numbers, something like that, some metadata. Um, but this header can be followed by an extended header. And we use this extended header to add authentication, as we will see later. Another uh, interesting decision that we made is that we do not put in the header any specific uh, explicit memory address, uh, but we uh, use the concept of partition. So we assume that the flash is divided in partition and every image is targeting a partition. Um, the current partition scheme is quite simple. Uh, on D2000, we have just one partition uh, designed to host an x86 application. And on Quark SC, we have two partitions, one for the x86 core and one for ARC. Uh, other partition schemes are, however, possible, including multiple partitions per core, in order to have uh, some functionality like a fallback image in case of future OTA, OTA extension and stuff like that. Um, Yes, this is the flash partition that uh, we have in our MCUs. Um, so as I said, we didn't want to have just firmware upgrades, but we also wanted other uh, functionality available, uh, especially because we wanted to do key provisioning. And uh, so we defined this QFM protocol, the Quark firmware management protocol, um, which is basically a request response protocol requests are sent using uh, DFU to load transactions and response are collected, are either piggybacked on um, uh, the status of the download transaction, the resulting status, or are, if they are complex responses, responses like the system information response, uh, they are extracted using a DFU upload transaction. An example will probably make it clear, like when we want to do a key update, we transfer the update key request and the key itself in a DFU download transfer as it, if, it is, uh, if it was a, an image, right? But it is not an upgrade image, it's a new key. And then we see uh, from the status of the transaction, transaction we know if uh, the key update has been su successful or not. Um, for system information retrieval, things are more complicated. Again, we transfer uh, the request in a download request, but then we collect the response uh, using a upload request. So we extract the response basically from the device. That's the idea. Um, before I mentioned that we make use of alternate settings and to use with two uh, is that basically we have decided that we wanted to provide a way for the device to know if the host was going to transfer uh, QF, the QFM packets or images. So we decided that alternate setting is used for transferring QFM packets, uh, while alternate settings one or greater than one are used for firmware upgrades. And specifically, each alternate set, we have one alternate setting for every partition. The advantage of doing that is that on the FUTIL, you can list the alternate settings they, that you have, and you get this uh, nice overview of the partition that you have in your uh, system using a native tool, uh, the util. So n nothing proprietary. Um, obviously, we also had to implement some uh, OS tools, so not just embedded code here. And we decided to use uh, some Python to be platform independent. And we have two scripts, basically. One for creating the image um, that this uh, image creator script basically converts a raw image into a QFU, DFU image that can be downloaded to the device using a DFU tools. Um, and then 
uh, we have another um, script that basically implements the QFM functionality uh, and allows, a, for instance, information retrieval or key provisioning. And internally, this other script calls DFU util in order to transfer the request and collecting the response. So this is an example of how QFU images are created. Um, you, as you said, you have to specify the binary um, that you just compile, and then you have to specify the partition on which you want uh, the binary to be installed. And then you can specify other metadata like the application version. And uh, then you enter firmware management code a uh, mode, and then you flash the image using um, DFU util or QM DFU util, depending on if you want to use U USB or UART. The important thing is that you basically have to specify the same alternate setting of the partition. Um, this is, these are a few examples of our in, uh, QM manage, uh, the QFM script uh, can be used. And this is an example of the kind of information you can retrieve uh, from our bootloader uh, using DFU. And for instance, the version of the bootloader, the SOC type, um, the number of uh, core you have, uh, if you have an um, application installed or not, and stuff like that. So as uh, all of what I've shown so far is already available, uh, what I'm going to show now is a, the secure firmware upgrade extension that will be available in the next release, and it is expected in weeks. And well, what this new release will provide is basically authenticated firmware upgrades. Um, unfortunately, given the re limited resources of our SOCs, uh, we couldn't use a public uh, key scheme. Uh, so we use a simple symmetric key scheme, um, which is HMAC. And uh, uh, this means that the image is, uh, is uh, verified using the same key that is used uh, to sign it. And uh, this also means that the key must be located uh, in, the, in the device. And we decided not to record the key in the device, but to provide users with the key management functionality so that they, they can, at runtime, uh, provide the key. And the key can also be updated uh, in case it is leaked somehow. Um, how we provide the secure uh, firmware upgrade extension? Uh, it's almost kind of simple. We extended the header, adding uh, a, the HMAC extended header, which contains all the information that is needed to uh, authenticate the image. Um, an interesting concept is that we do not authenticate, uh, well, we don't compute the HMAC for the entire image. What we do is that uh, we authenticate the header. And inside the header, we put uh, an array of hashes, one for each block that compose the image. So during, during the upgrade, what happens is that the first packet that we transfer is the header. And we authenticate the header. Uh, computing the HMAC of it and comparing the one that is in the header. Once the header is authenticated, we know that the SHA are authentic. And then uh, we start receiving uh, blocks of images. And for every block, we compare, um, we compute the SHA of the block and we compare it with the one that we have in the header, uh, which was authenticated. So the uh, block itself is authenticated. A problem that we had to solve. Um, it was how to ensure parti partition consistency, how to uh, handle uh, failures that can leave partition in an inconsistent state, like reset during an update. In order to do that, we basically associated a consistency flag to each partition. And uh, this uh, metadata is stored in the bootloader data, which is some data that is handled by the bootloader. Um, in a persistent way. So what we do is uh, when, the, when the upgrade starts, after we have received the header and authenticated it, and when we receive the first block, basically, we mark the partition as inconsistent. And then we start writing it. And uh, once the upgrade is uh, terminated, we basically mark the partition back as consistent. 
if during the upgrade something happens, um, like a reset, uh, the partition will remain marked as inconsistent. And at every boot, what we do is uh, to check for inconsistent, inconsistent partitions and erase them and mark them back as consistent. We have to erase them because we have no way to recover from them. But it's better to have uh, a, an, an empty partition, so no application booting, than an application that boots and, does, and that is corrupted and can create safety issues. Um, as I said before, we also provide a key management uh, feature. So the key is not our coded, the, the device, um, when you program, when you program the, um, the bootloader, uh, the device is unprovisioned. And then you have to provide uh, the keys. And we basically uh, define a, a special key update request as an extension of the QFM protocol. And uh, this uh, request is authenticated as well uh, using uh, the firmware key, which is the key that we use for authenticating the image, but also another key, which is the revocation key. We call it the revocation key. Uh, this double signing adds some security. And um, it is important to note that the key update request is uh, not encrypted. Uh, this is obviously uh, not fine for OTA, but since we are supporting um, only wired and point-to-point -point transport, like UART and USB, the risk of a made-in-the-middle attack is uh, negligible, I'd say. So uh, it is fine with our current configuration. But if we move to OT8, then, uh, then this, is, this is a decision that we must revisit. And as I said, we have um, two keys, the firmware key and the revocation key. The firmware key, um, the, important of it, uh, the importance of, it, of having the revocation key is that, and double signing the update of the key, is that if the firmware key is leaked, an attacker can update, um, can change the firmware, but it, it cannot update the key. So it cannot take complete control of the device. And at the same time, uh, if the revocation key is leaked, but the firmware key is not, uh, again, an attacker cannot update the key because it also needs the other key. That's the main re reason, reason of having the two, key, the two keys. And the revocation key can be updated as well using the same mechanism of the firmware key. So again, there is a double signature there. These are the packets that we use. And uh, basically, they are the same packets. Uh, the only thing that, that changes is the type um, that identifies which key must be updated. And then uh, we transfer the key as well, and we uh, compute the HMAC of the packet using both keys, which means we compute the HMAC of the entire packet using uh, the firmware key, and then uh, we get an HMAC, and on this HMAC we compute an another HMAC using the uh, revocation key. And uh, the final HMAC is compared with the one on, in the packet. Um, first time provisioning is a bit special here because uh, you don't have the key set yet. So what we do is we define some magic uh, key that uh, are assumed to be preloaded, uh, which are basically zero. And um, so uh, during the first provisioning, uh, you must first provide the revocation key, uh, which is si signed twice with the magic key. And then you provide the firmware key, which is signed uh, with the magic key in place of the firmware key, which is not there yet. And then the revocation key that you have just set. We also try to enforce the key provisioning by not enabling um, the upgrade until the keys are set, basically. So, um, bootloader data. I mentioned before that we have to uh, store some persistent data, and the, the bootloader has to manage uh, this persistent data in order to work properly. Well, the best example are, are the authentication keys. Uh, that must be stored somewhere, but uh, I, I also mentioned already the partition uh, consistency flag. And this boost loader data must be resilient to update failures and possible attacks. And we try to achieve this resilience uh, with duplication 
and verification at each boot. So basically, the pool loader data has two copies, identical copies, store in uh, each copy as a CRC uh, to verify its integrity, and the two copies are stored in different flash pages. This is because uh, when, you have, when you update even a single byte of a page, you have to actually delete the entire page and then update it. So you cannot put the two images in the same, uh, the, the two uh, data in the same uh, page. And then every time BL data is updated, we update the two copy in the same order. Main first, backup then. Uh, yeah, this is where we store uh, BL data in our SSC. And um, as I said, at every boot, we perform some uh, verification of PL data uh, to ensure that uh, data is consistent. There are a few cases that we need to consider. The first one is the lack of initialization. BL data is not meant to be flashed uh, together with the bootloader, but during the first boot, the bootloader creates it. And um, the bootloader detects lack, lack of initialization by verifying that uh, the a region, flash region, where we store the data is completely blank, so FFF in our case. And then another situation that can happen is that one of the two um, copy are corrupted, uh, is corrupted. And this can happen, for instance, because during, uh, while we were updating the copy, uh, we had a power loss or a reset. And this is detected because the CRC will not match and uh, so we go and check the other copy, which should be valid, uh, and then we copy it over the corrupted one. Uh, the other copy will contain the latest valid bootloader data. Then there is another situation in which we, both copies are corrupted. This should never happen because we update, since they are stored in different pages, so they cannot be updated at the same time. Um, so if that happens, we consider it a hardware fault or a kind of hardware security attack. So um, for us, this is an unrecoverable situation, and we enter an infinite loop. We do not reinitialize uh, the PL data, because doing so will put the device in unprovisioned state, so the, the key can be changed and uh, security is compromised. Yes, this is the detail of the verification flow. Um, as you can see, at the end, uh, after we have uh, sanitized PL data, verified and sanitized PL data if needed. We sanitize the partitions. Um, and this is the content of BL data. I'm not going to go into details, many details here, but uh, as you can see, we store the firmware key. Um, and uh, we have these partition descriptors and target descriptors, which basically are our way to define our partition table. Um, we decided to store the partition table, uh, not, not to our code the partition table in the code, but uh, to have it in BL data, because in the future we may want to have some kind of runtime run feature that allows us to change the partition table. And this design will allow it. Um, so we have this concept of partition and targets. A partition is a portion of flash that is designed to host an application. And uh, each partition is associated with a target, which is a computation uh, unit, capable, computing unit capable of uh, basically running the hosted application. At the moment, we support just one uh, partition per target. So as already mentioned, on D2000, we have only one target. So we only have one partition. And on C1000, uh, we have two targets, ARC and AX86. So we have two partitions. Uh, but the design is actually allows us to have multiple uh, partitions per, um, per target um, so that we can implement, for instance, a fallback partition in case of OTA updates so that if the update fails, uh, we still can run an application. And or we can have some kind of uh, partition that is are meant to host a, a different application and uh, somehow the user can switch between the two. So the, the possibility are many here. And another thing that this design allows um, is having um, what we call external target or partitions. Um, so if in, on our board, we can have some, um, 
for instance, a BLE module. So some peripherals uh, that is external to SOC, but they can um, have some firmware as well. And uh, we can define this as a new target, and uh, a, a, a new target will have a new partition, a new partition will have a new alternate setting, and when we set that alternate setting, basically we process the QFU image in a different way, and instead of programming the flash, we program the BLE module. This is not done yet, but the design allows it. Um, yeah, this is the final flash layout that we have. Um, as I mentioned before, we put all the, uh, uh, the code of the bootloader in the OTP, uh, but this is true only for firmware management over UART. When we <coughs> use USB, uh, in the case of the C1000, we, uh, there is no way to fit a USB stack in AK, at least we didn't find it. So what we did is to add the second stage bootloader uh, that is uh, booted only when firmware management is requested. So conclusions. Uh, I said that there are some code that we think could be reusable because it's not platform uh, uh, dependent. This is uh, the DFU state machine, which is also independent from actually the lower layer communication layer because we, we use um, the same DFU state machine for both UART and USB. And then there is all the DFU over UART adaptation. Um, so the QDA protocol and the X modem protocol. They are actually uh, platform independent and, and we have used uh, basically the same code on both the embedded device and the, uh, our modified version of DFU util. So it's exactly the same code, C code. And then, uh, well, there are the Python scripts uh, for generating the images. Unfortunately, the code for parsing the image and, and, and flashing that is uh, SOC specific. Some, this is the last slide, some lessons that we have learned um, is, first of all, that the modular approach pays back in embedded as well. Uh, we are glad that we go, choose to not pre-optimize for footprint um, because this allows us to adapt to changing requirements and uh, as I said, we could use some of the code on the OS tools as well, so not just the embedded. And uh, we somehow we could validate the DFU state, the same state machine is validated on two different transports and two different uh, possible communication errors. And then again, we try to reuse as much as open source code as possible. So we, instead of reinventing the wheel, we use DFU util and we fork it. The advantage of doing that was also that basically we provide the same user experience for both DFU over USB and DFU over UART. And another thing that we uh, find that, like, great was using uh, link time optimization. That basically offset most of the overhead that the modular approach introduces. Um, so combining the two is, uh, uh, was a, a great thing for us. We could save from 15 to 20% of flash of footprint. Uh, the only drawback of LTO is that complicates uh, debugging uh, quite a lot. So that's all. Uh, thank you for your attention and any questions? Yep. Uh, I'm not totally getting it, sorry. Yeah. I think you're, I'm not sure which order you did, but basically you're, you have the revocation key, and you're and taking a result, you're re encrypting once the revocation key, and then once the DFU key, right? Yeah. If you can say, encrypting, just look at the, look at the, um, the revocation key. If I encrypt the revocation key with the DFU key, and that results in a valid key, different, then that double encryption is exactly the same as using an alternate key. Well, you, you need both key to update the key. Now, when? Uh, 
uh, I'm sorry. Well, because, I, I, of the because of the way the algorithm works, if you encrypt with, the, with two separate keys and two steps, it's the equivalent of, of taking that and using a third uh, key to end up with the same result. Yes. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I, I see your point now. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah, that, that's true. Yeah. Uh, the point is that the third key is not stored anywhere. It's the combination. Yeah. Well, uh, the, the idea was defending from uh, a leaked key. Yeah. So you had both key to be leaked. But yeah, if you can... Yeah. Yeah. But then you have to find it somehow. So it's a different kind of attack. It's not a leaked situation. No, but I see your point. It's, it's a good point. Yes. What's the scenario that uh, we just imagine that uh, uh, at some point a, a vendor may decide to uh, just delete the firmware that it has on his device. Uh, it's just something that actually we got asked to. <laughs> so. Yeah. It might be tampered, yeah. More with. yeah, we got asked. <laughs> That also makes sense. <laughs> Another question? Yep. Um, so, or you kind of, I think some of the steps you mentioned are just mixed steps. Do you see widespread adoption in, in, within Intel without any kind of Sorry, can you repeat the question? Do, do, you, do you see widespread adoption of this architecture inside Intel? Uh, I I don't know. <laughs> we, uh, we hope so. Yeah, that, 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 that's what we hope so. Uh, we we will see. Yeah, that's the intent. Yeah. Thanks. No other question? Okay. Thank you very much.